Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, you've heard the phrase, the calm before the storm. But I'm telling you that for a Christian, we need to think of this phrase a little differently. It's the storm before the calm. And many of you are going through storms right now in your life. There are things that are happening physically, financially, things happening in the family. And how many of you know that things can happen in the family? I have a series on how to deal with a family reunion over this holiday weekend. Many of you should listen to that. You need to understand that everything's not your fault. And just because somebody talks about you, you don't have to talk back. But with these storms in life, what we need to understand is there's a place that God has for us beyond the storm. And that's a place of calm. Wouldn't it be nice to have a day of total peace? A day when you get up and you know that today's going to be a good day. And there's a smile on your face and a snap in your step and and all of the pressures that have been coming down on you so much that you just don't have those. You're not having to hide from the repo man down the street. You can answer any call that comes in on your phone without any fear whatsoever. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, I want to share a scripture with you, and we're going to look through this. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. And guess what we're going to talk about? Jesus walking on the water. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Would you just dub in some applause back there? It <laughs> seems like we've had people shooting off fireworks way too late last night. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, let me ask you something. Do you really believe that this happened? I mean, do you really believe this happened? You know, we hear these stories in the Bible. We, we think about the miracles that took place in the Bible. But is it just Jesus who did this? Is he the only one who can walk on water? I mean, for years when we had visitors here, we would pass out life jackets just so that, you know, we didn't want any of them to sink. Is this microphone on? You got the sound on? Are they hearing me? Okay, that's good. Good. Thank you. But Jesus actually walked on the water. I mean, he actually did that. Now, I would suggest if you're going to experiment with it, that you experiment in the bathtub or something and not out on the lake. But it really happened. And verse 26, and it says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the, on the sea, they were troubled. Well, that Greek word there for troubled doesn't, doesn't mean that they were just raising an eyebrow. They were, you know, in the words of Elvis, they were all shook up. Yeah, you're waking up now. Come on. But it was disturbing to them. Why? Because they had never seen this before. Let me tell you something. If you trust in God, you may see some things you've never seen before. According to the Word of God, you're only going to receive what you believe. If you don't believe it, you won't receive it. That's how you got saved. I mean, the Scripture we all know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And then there's a qualifier there. Whoever believed in Him. Who did Jesus die for? He died for everybody. He died for Saddam Hussein. He died for Adolf Hitler. He died for Bob Ulrich. But who gets saved? Only those who believe. Now, now let, me, let me give you another thought here. I hear people say all the time, Jesus did this because he was the Son of God. 
But the reality is, is he didn't do this because he was the son of God. And he told his disciples over and over and over again that he came to earth as the son of man, not the son of God. He, he was born under the law and he came as a man. In fact, at one place, he said, everything that I've done, you can do. And then he adds this. He says, and you can even do greater works than these. So here he is, walking in the water, walking on the water, and his disciples see him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, and here's what they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. You need to understand that faith and fear are the two spiritual forces that activate the power of God or the power of the enemy in the realm of the Spirit, in the dimension of the Spirit. Everything that God has for you is activated by you believing in it. If you don't believe it, you don't receive it. If you believe it, you receive it. Faith is the catalyst that activates the power of God. Believing Him causes his angels to go to work for you to accomplish what you can't do. Now, the Scripture doesn't say that the angels of God minister to you. Now, now follow me on this. It says that they minister for you. In Hebrews, it tells us the purpose of angels. Now, we know that angels have two basic purposes. One is to worship God, and the second one is to minister for the saints, and that's you. For those who will inherit salvation is what it says. That's us. There are literally billions, if not trillions, of angels of God on this earth, and their purpose is to worship God and to minister for you. But here's the deal. They're not going to minister for you unless you believe it. Psalm 103, verse 20, says that the angels of God are mighty in strength, and they hearken and heed. That word heed means that they hear and they act on. They hearken and heed the voice of His Word. Not the thought of His Word, the voice of His Word. And so what are angels doing? They are setting by excuse the term, but they're just basically sitting by, waiting to hear the voice of God's Word. Because that's what they act on. When they hear the Word of God, that's what the Scripture says. The angels, they act on the voice of His Word. How do they hear the voice of His Word? Through you. Your voice. You are the body of Christ here on the earth right now. And I don't mean to be too simplistic, but God is in heaven. Remember, Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who, where? Art in heaven. And then Jesus said, I'm going to be where? With the Father. But we're not going to leave you like orphans. When I go to be with the Father, He's going to send His Spirit here to be with you. Isn't that good? So we have the Spirit of God here on the earth. Where is the Spirit of God? If God sent His Spirit here to the earth, where is His Spirit? He's in those who are born again. Paul put it this way. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Spirit of God who dwells in you? So you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, and your mouth is the mouth that's got to speak the Word of God. And when you say the Word of God, then the angels stand up and do their best to work for you to accomplish that Word. That's why your words are so important. That's why believing God, faith is just simply, you know, faith kind of gets one of those names, you know, like somebody says, oh, faith healer, you know, and they kind of sneer when they say faith healer. Well, Jesus was a faith healer, you know. 
So I guess if it's okay for him, it's okay for me. There's nothing wrong with being a faith healer because that means we believe God for our healing. Hmm. So here we are. We have a choice. We can either operate in faith, believing God, or we can operate in fear. Now, as many of you know, my family used to own a boat manufacturing plant, a factory. We have literally thousands of boats on this lake that were made at that plant in Kansas. And uh, the boats were fiberglass. But fiberglass is a liquid. Fiberglass is a liquid. And you can make several different things out of fiberglass. You can make a boat. You can make a kitchen sink. You can make a bathtub. You can even make a Corvette out of plastic. Fiberglass. But that fiberglass is a liquid. It's a liquid. And it depends on what you pour it into. But if you pour that fiberglass liquid into a boat mold and you just leave it there and you come back later and you turn the mold upside down, that, that fiberglass will just run out. Why? It's a liquid. Well, how does it become solid? It has a catalyst. And it's called the hardener. And you take just sometimes a few drops of that hardener before you pour it in the mold. And you mix it in there. And that catalyst activates that fiberglass. And then that fiberglass becomes hard. And it, it becomes whatever you want it to be. It can be a bathtub. It can, it can be a boat. Whatever. But it's just a liquid until you add the catalyst. Now let me tell you something. That's the way to, the Word of God is. You know, you, you can read the Bible all you want. Adolf Hitler wrote, read the Bible. You can read the Bible, but it's when you add that catalyst to the Word of God that makes it work. And that catalyst is faith. Faith is the catalyst that makes the Word of God work. Now, there's two spiritual forces, faith and fear. They're opposites. You can't be in one without the other. That's why in an airplane you have a gauge that tells you the rate of ascent and the rate of descent. Why don't you have two gauges? One shows you when you're going up and one shows you when you're going down. Well, we have a pilot right over here. The reason is, is because you can only be doing one at a time. You can't be going up and down at the same time. Why? It's impossible. Why? Because they're opposites. And we understand opposites, hot, cold, east, west, up, down. We understand that. But in the Hebrew, it's faith, fear. They're opposites. And this is why the Bible tells us hundreds of times, do not be in fear. Because fear activates the negative angelic beings. Faith activates the angelic beings of God. And you say, well, it really doesn't really matter all that much what I say. I mean, not really. Well, it does. Because Jesus said, you watch the words you say that you don't even think mean anything. You watch your idle words. That means they're not in gear. <laughs> you watch your idle words. And then he goes on to say this right after that. Because by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. It's not what other people say about you. It's what you say about you. And you may think, well, it just doesn't really matter. Well, Jesus said it did. You say, well, I'm a failure. I'll never get through this. And you know what? You won't. Why? Because you confessed it. That's what you're believing. You've got to believe what God's Word says. Well, what does God's Word say? 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes I have been healed. Well, is that true or is that a lie? Is it true? Well, that's, that's a good verse. Well, it's a good verse, but do you believe it? See, and, and that's the key. Do you really believe it? And sometimes we say we believe something, but we don't. We've got faith in the head, but not in the heart. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. That does not help you any at all. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. 
Why does he say, do not be afraid? Because there is no power in fear that will help you. Fear is a negative force. I mean, we all know this. The Bible says 365 times, one for each day of the year. The Bible says, fear not. Why? It's an important thing to not walk in fear. When the doctor tells you something, when the banker tells you something, when your family tells you something that would normally bring fear, check yourself. And ask yourself, what they are saying, does it line up with the Word of God? Does it line up with the Word of God? Does it, are they saying what God's Word says? Are they saying about me what God says about me? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am righteous. Not because of what I have done, but because of what He has done. Are you following me? See, it's, it's about what does the Word say. Hmm. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Well, what was Jesus supposed to say? It's not me. No. <laughs> what, what could he say? So he says, it's me. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat and let me correct some of your theology here, Jesus is not the only person who walked on the water. It says here, Peter, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, isn't that good? He was on the right path. He was going the right direction. Hmm. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. What did he do wrong? When he saw when he saw what? When he saw something that looked like it was bad. When he saw the evil report. Well, as Christians, what does the Word tell us to do? We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, simply put, what does that mean? That means if your eyes see one thing and God says something else, you have to make a choice. Am I going to believe what I'm seeing? Or am I going to believe what God said? And then if you decide you're going to believe what God said, you're going to have to act like you believe it. Because when you get into fear, the result is you sink. All right. I did? Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> i got to tell you what I was thinking. I shouldn't, but I will. But I'm already into this sentence way too deep to stop now. There were two kids out in the atrium last week, and one of them said, you stink. And it, when I said, you sink, it kind of reminded me of that. And for those of you on my ministry team, uh, when you're up here and you think about something, always think about it twice before you say it. This is a, a lesson for you. Okay. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, did he sink all the way? No. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And that's important. I mean, it doesn't matter how far down you are. If you cry out to him, he answers you. And you say, but you, you don't know my past. Well, no, I don't. But he does. And he has forgotten it if you've turned yourself over to him. Isn't that interesting? You know, Gary Stearman wrote a book called Time Travelers of the Bible. And uh, got to be honest, I haven't read it all. I've read parts of it. But one thing that I really uh, think is interesting is God must be a time traveler. He must be a time traveler. Because somehow, if I've done all this sinning, and then I repent... Somehow, God went back into the past and eliminated my sins. He didn't cover them up. He eliminated them. And there's a big difference there. That's why we have the new covenant. You know, under the, under the old covenant, it's kind of like you have a, a little red wagon and you got it full of 
manure. Okay. And, and you don't want that manure to show? You can throw a tarp over it. And you can hide it. That's what the word atone means. It means to cover. And under the old covenant, the sins were covered. That's why the priest had to go in every year, you know, on Yom Kippur. They had to go in every year on the Day of Atonement. Why? For the sins of the people. Get those things covered up again. But Jesus, see, He didn't come and atone for our sins. He came and He remitted our sins. And here's the difference. He took the little red wagon he dumped it out over the hill. He cleaned it out with Clorox. It's brand new. And there is nothing that needs to be covered because it's not there. Our sins are no more. Isn't that good? I mean, I started to say, think about all the bad things you did, but we'd be here for quite a while. Don't. But let me tell you something. All the bad things that you've done, they're under the blood, and the blood has cleansed us. You know, we even have a song we sing here at church. It's an old song, and it talks about how uh, the blood of Jesus covers our sin. And we change the words, because that's not true. The blood of Jesus cleanses us of our sins. And he walked on the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus did what he always does. If you cry out to him, he stretched out his hand and caught him, and he said, O oh, you of what? Little faith. Now, actually, the Greek word there means undeveloped. O oh, you of undeveloped faith. See, we've all been given a measure of faith. As believers, we've all been given a measure of faith. But we need to develop it. And how do you develop that faith? So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? A fancy preacher? Hearing a good story? Hearing a testimony? Now faith comes one way, by hearing the Word of God. Now see, you can get faith from a testimony if the testimony contains the Word of God. You can get faith from a good story if that good story contains the Word of God because the Word of God is the source of faith. That's what our our faith is in. It's, our faith is in what God says, not on an excitement. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, undeveloped faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Hmm. Now, if he had faith, even undeveloped faith, how could he have faith and doubt. Hmm. Well, see, that's how do you get rid of the doubt? With the Word of God. In with the Word, out with the doubt. In with the Word, out with the doubt. Now, here's, here's the difference between doubt and unbelief. Now, now follow me on this, because this might be a little bit of a brain twister for some of us. But doubt is a condition of not fully soaking in, reading, and hearing the Word of God. Enough. The more you hear the Word, the less doubt there is. And that's kind of a natural process. Belief and unbelief, that's a choice. You choose what you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe. When Bob and Christy were dating, Chrissy were dating, I'm sure that there was a point in time where he said to her, Chrissy, will you marry me? And knowing them the way I do, she probably said, I'll think about it. So she went and met with her girlfriends. Her girlfriend said, what's up? She said, well, you know Bob, the guy with the cool car. And, I mean, he's flashy. He asked me to marry him. Well, what did you tell him? I told him I'd think about it. Well, do you love him? I don't know. He's such a nice guy. I've just got to pray about it and think about it some more. 
So she prays about it and thinks about it. She sees Bob on their next date. He's taking her to her favorite restaurant. So they're at the drive-thru. And uh, she, he says, Chrissy, have, have you thought about it anymore? About, you know, what I ask you? And she says, well, yes, I have. And yes, I will marry so later that evening, she is with her girlfriends. And her girlfriend says, well, have you made a decision? She said, yes, we went out to the Golden Arches today. And we were in the car, and he asked me, and, and I said, yes. And she said, look at this ring. I'm so in love with him. Now, wait a minute. One day she didn't know if she was in love or not, and the next day she is in love. One day she didn't know if she was going to marry him. And next, What changed? It was a decision. And from the point she said yes, from then on, every time one of her girlfriends came up, I'm getting married, here's the ring, I love Bob. I, and he is so cool, I love Bob. What changed? A decision. See, and that's kind of like when we get saved. You, you've been given a measure of faith, and you've been given enough faith to get saved, but you, you may not have enough faith to walk on the water yet because your faith may be undeveloped. See, that's why it's so important for us as Christians. In these last days, you know, the Bible says, don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves as we see that day approaching, that day of his return. Why? Because when we gather together, what are we doing? We're looking at the word of God. And it builds our faith. See, we need to have so much faith that if somebody comes up and, and puts a gun in our chest and says, deny Jesus or I'm pulling the trigger, that you can have a smile on your face and say, I love Jesus, I'll never deny him, and have no fear. Because to you it just represents a one-way ticket home. You know, there, there's no fear. You shouldn't be able to you shouldn't be able to threaten a Christian with death. Because we don't have death. As my son said in so many of his sermons the last year he was here, he said, we don't die as Christians, we depart. And we just move from one level of glory to another level of glory. You know, the Bible says we move from glory to glory. And, and think about the old song, and it's so true, every day with Jesus is better than the day before. Every glory with God is better than the glory the day before. Our best days are yet to come. Your worst days are behind you. You should be thinking this way. Today is the best day of my life so far. No weapon formed against me can prosper. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The joy of the Lord is my strength and I'm one happy guy. I think it was in the 26th chapter of Acts where Paul said this. He said, I think myself happy. Well, you know, you can, you can think yourself happy or you can think yourself depressed. I mean, in September of 2019, when the doctor ran out in the rain from the cancer hospital and told me, told Loretta in front of me, as the rain's coming down, we're getting in her car in the parking lot, that I had three months to live. They told me I had stage four. Well, I have stage zero now, by the way. But, but, but here, here's the deal. What did we do? Did Loretta look at me and I look at her and we go, oh, oh, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. Well, I probably would have. Because if, that's, if, if I let fear grip me, I'm going to get what I believe, according to the Scripture. I mean, Jesus said it several times, as you have believed, so be it unto you. And we take these things so lightly. We become so denominationalized, so Christianized, so churchized, that we just take phrases like that and just kind of let them slip by. But it was a big deal to Jesus when he said that, when he said, let it be as you have believed. 
What you have believed is what's going to happen. Remember the time when it, when it was spoken in the Scripture. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. The guy could have said, are you blind? Don't you see my condition? I can't walk. And where would you have been? He would still been there. Pick up your bed and walk. Pick up my bed? You've got to be kidding me. No, but evidently the guy believed he could walk or he wouldn't have stood up and taken the bed. See, and let me ask you this. What are you believing? What's in your wallet? <laughs> what, what are you believing? Are you believing that this is the end of the line for you? You know what Loretta and I did? Doctor told her that. We went down and got a Starbucks. Probably never really even talked about it all that much. Because we believe the Word of God. Now, now don't, don't get all weird on me here. I'm not saying if somebody's not feeling good, or you're sick, or you got some attack, that, that something's wrong with you, and you just don't have faith, and you're not believing God. No. You may be going through a process. It may, it may take a while before you see the full manifestation. But here's the deal. It's kind of like talking about the tribulation period. Those who endure to the end will be saved. Well, it's the same way with the Word of God. Don't give up on the Word of God. Endure with it. Stay with it. And, and, and don't just say, I believe God's going to get me out of this mess. I'm believing I'm out of this mess. And then when you see that you're not out of this mess, then you start getting all afraid and believing what you see instead of what God says, and you end up like Peter and you start to sink. See, believing is the fight of faith that we must fight that is so difficult. The Scripture says, fight the good fight of faith. What, what is See, faith, that's kind of a paistos, it's that Greek word, it's just kind of churchy. Fight the good fight of faith. No. Fight the good fight of believing God. Why is it a fight? Because everyone around you and your eyes and everything will be trying. We live, we're not of this world, but we're in this world, and this world is trying to get you to believe what the enemy wants for you. God is trying to show you in his word what he wants for you. And you have to choose what he wants and not accept what the enemy says. You can accept what the enemy has and you'll get what the enemy has. And you don't want that. Now, this is a deviation from my notes. Well, I'm going to keep with it for just a moment. Which, by the way, we're on page one and there's only six pages. So just bear with me. I think we'll put those over there for next week. Ah. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. What was that? That was the calm after the storm. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, I was going to go someplace else, and there may be some people that are thinking, well, please just go. <laughs> but I'm going to end with a different scripture. So we have an amazing video department. Angie is just over the top amazing. One of these days, we need to bring her out here and just give her some roses, you know, and, because she does so good. So um, let's go to Mark 11:24. I've shared with this you with this shared this with you many times, but I think it's, it's um, apropos, which, by the way, I don't know what that word means, but appropriate? appropriate? Okay. It, let's take a look at this scripture. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, let me give you a little Greek lesson here. If you look in your Bibles, you'll find that the word them is italicized. Okay? That means it's not there. That means that it was added by the translators to enhance the meaning that they thought that this verse was. So take the word them out. Now, 
Some of your Bibles are going to say this correctly, and some of them won't. depends on what translation you have. But where it says, believe that you receive them, the Greek word there is in the past tense. Believe that you have received them. Some of your Bibles will even say it that way. But the reason they usually don't say it that way, because to the natural mind, it makes no sense to put it the way it really is written. So here's what I say. Here's what it says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them. Believe that you have received and you will have. Believe that you have received, past tense, believe you've already got it, and you will have. This is why 1 Peter 2.24 says, by the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. It doesn't say, by the stripes of Jesus, you will be healed. It says, you have been healed. Because we are to believe God's word so strongly that as far as we're concerned, it's already happened. It's already done. When God says he's going to give you something or do something for you, as far as you're concerned, it is so established, you believe it's already done. And if you can believe, now, now follow, here's where it gets confusing. If you can believe it's already been done, then it will be done. So what do you do while you're believing that it has been done? You're walking by faith and not by sight. You're going by what God said instead of what the world is trying to show you or what the world is saying to you. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Well, that is your lesson for today. And I'm excited about today. You know why? Because if you trust in the Word of God, you'll have freedom. Freedom from sickness and disease, freedom from poverty, and freedom from death. You know, Galatians 3.13 says we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. If you go back to Deuteronomy 28, you're going to find that the curse of the law had, had three basic things. Death, sickness, and disease, and poverty. And Jesus came to redeem us from death, sickness, and disease, and poverty. You're only going to receive what you can believe. And most people can receive salvation real easy. They can believe that we've been redeemed from death. I have everlasting life. But do we believe we've been redeemed from sickness and disease? And do we believe that we've been redeemed from poverty? Well, here's the deal. If you don't believe it, you won't receive it. And I used to be the pastor of a church not too many miles from here, back when Loretta and I were very young. And I used to preach against what I'm preaching right now. And I used to think that people like me were mentally ill. But one day, an event happened in my life, and I decided, from this point on, I'm going to believe God's Word, even if it goes against my doctrine. You know, and that's a, that's a big challenge. Because when you go to church, everybody in that church, you build friendships based upon, sometimes based upon that doctrine. And you'll be amazed how quick, if you change your doctrinal belief, Instead of getting the right hand of fellowship, you get the left foot of fellowship. But what's more important? Yeah. The Word of God. This is the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, He said, if you abide in my Word. He didn't say if you abide in your denomination or if you, if you abide in your friendships. He said, if you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed. And then you'll know the truth. And that word for truth there is gnosko. That means intimately know the truth. And, you'll, and the truth will set you free. Isn't that good? All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. We give you the thanks. We thank you for the freedom that we have in your word. To live in your word is to be set free. We love you, Father. In the name of your Son, amen.